Hi, everybody. Welcome to Our Feelings Contagious, the Psychology of Shared Emotions. Anne's in France today and her computer died, so I don't feel bad for her at all. I'm Rick Lovard. I am the Program Director of the Science and Entertainment Exchange, a program of the National Academy of Sciences. If you haven't heard about us and what we do, if you are a writer, producer, director, storyteller, you have a question about science, uh, give us a call. Satchi will drop the number in the uh, chat down here, and uh, we can connect you with someone who can answer your question. Uh, we've done over 3,400 consults on so many films involving people flying around and wearing masks and capes, uh, in addition to documentary films, graphic novels, video games. Uh, one recent consult we've done that you uh, might have an interest in, uh, I mentioned it last time, is Paper Girls on Amazon Prime. I thought that was a good one, so check it out. Uh, if you are a STEM professional, it's your first time hearing about our program and you would like to volunteer or you have an interest in the work we're doing, please contact us. Uh, oh, she, she already put our email in there. She's ahead of me. Awesome. Nice job. Um, you can find a recording of the show on the Exchange's website after the event. You can subscribe to the Science and Entertainment Exchange on YouTube to see these events and other videos that we have up there, like our Ask a Scientist series, which just got a facelift. So I hope you can check that out. We're very excited about the new look. Uh, also, you can sign up for our Collider newsletter. Uh, when the video uh, of the event is available, everybody who RSVP'd is going to get an email. So uh, please check it out if you want to watch it again or if you aren't able to see the whole thing. Uh, today's sponsor is Howard Hughes Medical uh, Institute, without whose uh, generous support, we would not be able to do these events. We also get major funding from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and many individual donors like you. I want to thank anyone and everyone who is in the audience today who donated. That uh, money goes directly back into these events and helps us, us uh, keep doing these. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I also want to thank the American Psychological Association uh, for uh, working with us on this event. We're so excited uh, about this collaboration, um, and I hope you will be too in just a moment. Um, so today, you're going to hear from Wendy Berry Mendez, who studies emotion, intergroup relationships, stigma, and psychophysiology, which is sounds incredible to me. Um, and so she's going to give her talk, and uh, then Ahmed Best, uh, will join her to moderate a uh, conversation. Uh, if at any time you have a question, uh, you can just put it right down here in the Q&A. Please don't put it in the chat. Uh, we've disabled it. So put it down here in the Q&A and I will be in the background sending Ahmed those questions uh, and we'll get to as many as we possibly can today. We also have more questions than we can possibly answer, but uh, we'll get to as many as we can. By the way, Ahmed, you should check out his podcast, the Afrofuturist podcast. It's fantastic. And for those of you in our audience who uh, have never heard Ahmed before moderate one of our events, uh, you're in for a treat. He's amazing. Uh, anyway, uh, my rabbit hole this week is actually I'm cheating because it's one of Wendy's previous talks on gratitude, the science of gratitude. Uh, it's really interesting. I highly recommend it. And also there's a, a company article I found on uh, in psychology today on gratitude generally. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Mitch uh, Princeton to our stage. He is the CSO of the APA. And previously he directed the uh, clinical psychology at UNC Chapel Hill. So uh, Mitch, it's your stage. Hi everybody, thanks so much for having us. Thanks so much to the exchange for partnering with us, the American Psychological Association. We're the largest scientific and professional association of psychologists in the world and so excited to serve as its chief science officer and to be here with you. I just wanna really quickly talk with you just a little bit about psychological science before we turn it over to Wendy. You know, of course, when psychologists are depicted within the media, we're often depicted as being therapists. And that's half true. Half, half of psycho doctoral level psychologists are clinical counseling or school psychologists who do provide therapy. But the other half are scientists um, who work either in those areas or, um, or work in other areas. Mental health science is some of what we do as psychologists, but we actually study a wide range of different kinds of questions all related to human behavior. Did you know that when you experience chronic stress, it activates dormant DNA in, your, in every cell of your body and changes literally what genes are being expressed? Did you know that when you are on social media and you see that you have many likes, it has the potential to actually turn on certain brain regions 
and shut down brain regions that inhibit our behavior, really leading to potential addiction. Did you know that psychological science can predict who's gonna steal office supplies from work or drop out of school even years before it happens? Well, that's all what we do in psychological science. So many questions that we ask and answer related to all aspects of human behavior. At APA, we love to share information with the public about psychological science, and we wanna make it easy for you to start learning what we learn you can use this QR code or information in the chat to um, look at the articles in APA's flagship publication, which is The Monitor. Um, it's a wildly successful and award-winning publication where we summarize the top psychological science that we're learning about in the field. You can also um, uh, visit the podcast, the Speaking of Psychology, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Speaking of Psychology podcast, which has been incredibly successful and we have our top psychological scientists on there talking about their very latest findings and all of that, of course, you can access for free. One of the biggest questions in psychological science, of course, is the ways in which we experience our emotions and how we understand those emotions. Of course, about a hundred years ago, people thought that the mind and the body were two different systems. Of course, we know now that that's not true. And we're so excited to have one of our brightest stars and most prolific and esteemed psychological scientists, Dr. Wendy Berry Mendez here. She's from the University of California in San Francisco, and she's gonna be talking about some growing evidence that we experience other people's behavior in deeper ways than we thought. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Mendez to join us here and pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Mitch, and such a pleasure to be here today, um, and thank you for inviting me. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen, and I'm really excited to talk to you all today um, about how we experience emotions and stress. We're going to take a dive into the body and look at physiology, the changes in our physiological states as we experience stress and emotions, and um, hopefully talk about a few things that might be surprising. So my talk today, I've come up with um, sort of the idea of, I'm gonna tell you three short stories, um, all having to do with how emotions and stress affect our body and how those physiologic changes can then sort of leak up and affect our minds, our behaviors, the decisions, and the people around us. Um, I have three short stories, like I said, one, um, the first one has to do with affect contagion or how emotions and stress experienced um, by ourselves um, leak out, emanate from us uh, to influence people around us. Then I'm going to tell you about the most important nerve in your body. It's called vagus nerve. Vagus is Latin for wandering. It's the largest nerve in your body, and it's intimately tied with both your physical and mental health, your emotions, but also how you understand and perceive your social world. And then my last short story is, um, you know, maybe somewhat surprising. I'm a stress researcher, but um, instead of getting up here and telling you that stress is killing you, and by the way, it is bad for you, but not all stress is bad for you. And actually, if we differentiate um, stress responses, we can put them into two broad categories, one of which is um, stress that's quite good for you and helps you perform, um, helps you make better decisions, and is associated with better physical and mental health. So I will dive right into my first short story. And the first short story really is um, kind of starts with this idea of mimicry, right? And you can see mimicry throughout the animal kingdom, right? Crickets, crickets will chirp and frogs will croak in unison. We've all seen fish and, and birds fly in formation. Um, there's this uh, species of fiddler crabs that uh, the male fiddler crab has this large dominant claw. And as part of its mating ritual, it waves its dominant claw. And all the male fiddler crabs wave their claw in unison uh, to attract the female fiddler crabs, who then choose the crabs first with the largest claw. Um, so you see this synchronization occur throughout the animal kingdom. But humans synchronize too, and we mimic each other. And mimicry has these really important elements. Um, so if I like somebody, I'm more likely to mimic them. And if someone mimics me, I like them more. So mimicry has sort of these profound implications for our social world. 
but we can think of mimicry as extending to how um, emotions are shared between two people, how we might uh, make a sad face when somebody else makes a sad face. But I'm actually going to talk about something a little bit more indirect, a little bit more implicit, which is those emotions um, that change our physiology and how one person's emotional state um, in terms of their physiologic responses can then be caught or transmitted to another person. So I know I'm showing you like lots of scary graphs here, but let me just break this down. Imagine that you have two people interacting with each other and we can look at their physiologic responses and we can look at the same time point and say, how are people having similar rises and falls in physiology? Um, and that's one way to sort of understand that they're experiencing the same kind of response. But we can also ask, to what extent is one person's physiologic response predictive or changes their partner's physiology in a time lag response? Okay, so that's sort of the fancy part of it. Let me tell you how we do this from a physiologic perspective. We use um, a response that is directly tied to sympathetic nervous system activation. So get into your time capsule, travel back to the ninth grade, where you first learned about the sympathetic nervous system. And you probably learned that it was related to fight or flight. Well, as a professor in a medical school, I can tell you it only gets a little bit more complicated when we teach it to medical students because we teach it as the four Fs of the sympathetic nervous system. We teach the, it's, that it's fighting, flight, fleeing, freezing, and sex. So those are the four Fs of the sympathetic nervous system. But of course, um, these emotional states affect this sympathetic nervous system and how we measure it is uh, not with heart rate. I think that's what most people sort of think of with sympathetic nervous system. I'm gonna, but I'm going to teach you this sort of um, more nuanced way to understand your sympathetic nervous system. Okay. Imagine you just experienced something really exciting. Like you were on a roller coaster or um, you were in a haunted house and people like jumped out at you right? You might have had that reaction that, oh my gosh, I was so excited or I was so afraid. My heart was beating so fast. And people say that my heart was beating fast, but they're wrong. That's not why you can feel your heart. The reason that there are times in which you can feel your heart is because your heart is contracting with greater force. As sympathetic nervous system activation increases, the contractile force of those ventricles squeezes harder and your pre-ejection period shortens. And that's why you can feel your heart in some cases, but not in all cases because of pre-ejection period. When we're trying to understand the extent to which people influence each other in an emotional state, that's what we use, pre-ejection period. So that's all the fancy stuff that you need to understand. Let's talk about um, how do we study this kind of contagion from one person to another. Well, let's start with just the most obvious dyad in which you would imagine uh, two individuals being tightly linked emotionally, a mother and her baby. We've uh, conducted studies where we bring mothers and babies into the lab and we separate the mothers and baby uh, for a little bit. And what we do is we make the mother go through a very stressful interaction. She has to, she finds out she has to give a speech and do a math task in front of these very stoic evaluators who are looking down on her. And it is a very powerful paradigm to increase sympathetic nervous system activation. After we do that to the mothers, the baby who's in another room with a different caregiver, we bring back and put that infant right on the mom's lap. And we ask questions about the baby and the mom's uh, physiology as they're reunited. Now, most obviously, when we just ask the mom how she felt, um, giving a stressful task in front of a stoic audience versus here's an audience who's smiling at her versus um, doing this kind of task alone in a room with nobody looking at you, you can imagine it's, it creates much more negative emotion um, to get to have to perform in front of um, people who you just met who are looking down on you. So that part's not surprising. 
What's also not surprising is when we look at the mom's physiologic reactivity, that pre-ejection period that I told you about, and you see when that mom has to do that stressful task, she has an increase in sympathetic nervous system activation. But here's where it's really powerful in terms of understanding how affect contagion works. When we looked at the baby's response, and remember, babies aren't told anything about what the mom just experienced. They know nothing. The moms greet all the babies the same way and cuddle with their babies after once they've been reunited. But you see that the baby's physiology matches the mom's physiology. So only the babies whose mother had to complete this stressful task with this kind of mean, mean audience shows an increase in sympathetic nervous system activation. Then when we looked at the extent this this variable here means sort of how tightly linked. So my physiology changes, my baby's physiology changes. The more that's a positive number, the more tightly linked that mother and baby are. You can see that the mother and baby are highly linked um, in this paradigm. Um, but mothers and babies, it might be obvious that they, would, that they would be linked. What about people who just met each other? Well, in more than a dozen studies, we've looked in the lab at dyads who just met two people who've never met each other before, and we manipulate or create dyads in which there's some power or status difference. So take this um, picture in the middle here with a, um, our, our male confederate wearing either uh, sweats or a suit we brought in male subjects and told them that, that we were interested in looking at sort of wearables that were embedded in clothes. And we made our male subjects change into either sweats that were really cheap from Walmart with plastic shoes, or they changed into a suit. And what we found is that uh, when this male subject then interacted with another male subject who they just met, if they were wearing a suit, so they were perceived as higher in social status, they were more likely to influence their partner physiologically. Also, when they played a negotiation task, the guy with the suit always ended up with a better deal than the guy with the sweats. Um, but that's a manipulation with clothing. What about real world groups? We've also recruited people who are higher in socioeconomic status and people who are lower in socioeconomic status, put them together. We see the same kinds of effects. There's a type of power echo or power reverberates and influences people lower in status or power. Um, this transition or translates into real world settings as well. We've been studying uh, surgical teams and operating rooms for several years now. And if you uh, spent much time around surgical teams, very hierarchical. It's always very clear who sort of the top person in the room is. Um, and in our specific operating rooms, these are uh, surgeries during liver and renal transplants. And what we find across all of our operating room settings is that surgical teams do show co-variation, meaning that they have similar rises and fall in physiology throughout these four hour surgeries. But it's the person in charge, that head surgeon, that senior surgeon that dictates all of that kind of emotional and stress physiology. If we take like a scrub nurse or even an anesthesiologist and we ask how much do their emotions or physiology influence their team members, the answer is almost zero. The most important uh, person in that room in terms of setting that emotional state, physiological state, is the person holding the scalpel or the senior surgeon. So that's the end of my um, short story one. The other two stories are even a little bit shorter. I told you in the beginning, there's this vagus nerve, right? The longest nerve in your body. It innervates every single organ in your body, um, just about every organ. But most importantly, it innervates your, um, your heart too. It's uh, the cardiac vagus nerve. Now, if you looked at an ECG of your heart, like this ECG trace, you've seen it on probably TV and books, um, your heart, doesn't beat like a metronome. It's not perfect in terms of the time from one beat to a next. And in fact, you see, I put in here like, these are the, what we call interbeat intervals. And you see those numbers representing time differ. Now that is giving you a sense of the variability between heart rates. The higher your heart rate variability, the more your cardiac vagus nerve is influencing the heart and sort of helping it adjust and regulate. 
So you want high heart rate variability. Now, this was discovered back in the 1960s in um, neonatal wards, and they were finding that the infants who were not surviving were those who basically had metronomic um, heart rates, really steady heart rates, and that the influence of that cardiac vagus nerve showing variability in their heart rates is, was part of sort of these early indicators of good physical health. Well, why should you care about your vagus nerve? Well, it tends to be linked to just about every um, physical and mental health condition that we can think of. Um, definitely with cardiovascular disease and hypertension, there's strong evidence, for example, showing that if you survive a heart attack, low heart rate variability is associated with the um, increased heart attack and the short future. So high heart rate variability is protective of another heart attack heart attack shortly after. It's also linked to a lot of our mental health illnesses, especially the ones that um, fall along the lines of sort of mood, the depression and anxiety. So people with depression, social anxiety, tend to have lower heart rate variability. It's also linked to our emotional state. People higher in emotional well-being have higher heart rate variability. And when I feel something positive uh, or experience positive emotions, my heart rate variability increases. Well, it's also linked to your social world. So, <coughs> but, excuse me. <coughs> if I measure your, measure your heart rate variability, sorry. <coughs> if I measure your heart rate variability and show you these pictures of just people's eyes, and I ask you, what emotions are they feeling? The higher your heart rate variability, the better you are at detecting the emotions that people are experiencing. And we've done studies where we've measured people's heart rate variability, and we've exposed them to individuals who are either very accepting or very rejecting. And the higher your heart rate variability, the more sensitive you are to the social environment. So you're better at figuring out if somebody likes you or if somebody dislikes you. All right. Um, and then finally, how do you scale something like heart rate variability? Well, we were interested in people who engaged in non-suicidal self-injury. And we had these um, individuals, so these are people who engage in cutting and burning, um, primarily as a way to sort of, you know, help regulate their stress. Um, and we had people wear a light vest under their clothes for several days, and we asked them if at any point in time, you have the impulse to hurt yourself, go ahead and hit this event, event button. And what we found is that when we looked at people's heart rate variability, and this black uh, bar right here indicates that people engaged in self-harm. We can see that leading up to it about 20 minutes before they engaged in self-harm, they started having a reduction in heart rate variability. And then what's really dramatic is once they engaged in, in self-injury, they had a huge increase in heart rate variability, leading us um, to start understanding, you know, why this, you know, very, um, you know, profoundly negative, uh, you know, engagement that people are having to hurt themselves is bringing them some sort of psychological and emotional relief, um, showing this huge increase in heart rate variability after they hurt themselves. We've been doing studies where um, we're manipulating that vagus nerve using earbud technology. So the idea is we, with earbuds, we can put a vagal nerve stimulator um, on the tip of it, put it in people's ears, and then stimulate the vagus nerve to sort of help with um, preventing negative emotions or at least uh, limiting the duration of stress and negative emotions. So now my final story will be about differentiating stress responses. So we can all think of stress and we sort of have this mental model of what stress looks like. Um, but as I show you these two animals, you can see that um, in this very simple depiction, the stress that these two animals are feeling is not the same. And I would guess that the physiology underlying these two animals look very different. Now, first, the prey is trying to escape. He's trying to get away um, from being dinner, and the hunter is trying to capture dinner. So we can think of just these two um, physiologic states of the animals as good stress uh, versus bad stress, or promotion, right, trying to get dinner, and prevention, trying to not be dinner. 
Well, we can look at the physiologic system and differentiate this kind of good stress from bad stress. So for the purposes of this um, talk, I'll call the good stress challenge and the bad stress threat. So here's a simple way to think of challenge versus threat. So in both cases, when you're experiencing acute stress, you can have that increase in sympathetic nervous system activation that I told you early about, right? A decrease in that pre-ejection period. So your heart is beating with greater force. But in a challenge state, your heart is becoming more efficient. As it's cycling that blood through, it's increasing the amount of blood being ejected from the heart on each beat. So more oxygenated blood is getting produced by the heart. Then you have this vasculature system, all those arteries and vessels and veins carrying that oxygenated heart, uh, oxygenated blood. Imagine that, that that physiologic system, those vessels are opening like a like a hose, um, dilating, allowing more oxygenated blood to get up to the brain, to the arms and hands and legs and feet. So there's more oxygenated blood to help you run, to help you fight, but also more to the brain, maybe to help you think. So that's a challenge state. A threat state also has that increase in sympathetic nervous system response, but now all of those vessels are constricting, tightening. So now blood, oxygenated blood can't get through, less oxygenated blood to the brain and out to your arms and legs. Now you have poor performance, poor thinking, poor judgment. So those two stress responses are really distinct challenge um, associated with better health outcomes, short-term and long-term health, health outcomes, and threat with worse outcomes. Well, we can leap over uh, two decades of research have showed that good stress is associated with things like athletic performance. We recruited athletes to come to the lab prior to a season, and we measured their physiology doing um, a standard like laboratory stressor, you know, giving a speech, doing math in front of people. And we found that if they were more challenged in the lab, when we followed their performance on the athletic field in those clutch games, the challenge responders performed better, more likely to get on base, more likely to hit the ball in a clutch game. We also have um, used this paradigm to study uh, students about to take standardized tests, so those high state tests that determine whether you get into medical school or grad school. And for half of our subjects, we just taught them about challenge. We said, look, some people get aroused and, and kind of nervous when they're taking a test. Um, and we taught half of them that that arousal state is good for you. We taught them about challenge. Um, and the other half, we just sort of reiterated instructions. And we found that the students who we taught um, about these challenge states did better on the GRE um, and had better scores than those who we didn't teach. And finally, in studies where we're looking at um, thinking and judgment, um, we test whether people in challenge states versus threat states have differences in their deliberative thinking. So here's, here's a, a little riddle for you. If it takes five machines, five minutes to make five widgets, how long does it take 100 machines to make 100 widgets? Now, without thinking, your intuitive, reflexive answer might be 100 minutes. But of course, that's the wrong answer, right? Because you have production increase, outcome increase, and rate stays the same. So what we find is that when people are in a challenge state, they do this more deliberative and rational thinking. And when they're in the threat state, they'll do that intuitive, the 100 minute answer, the wrong answers. So it helps both thinking short-term and long-term thinking. Um, so that's uh, the end of my short story. So. Um, Again, you know, there's that affect contagion idea that our emotions and stress affect those around us from strangers and close loved ones in profound ways. But the most important element is that status matters, that higher status person, um, whether it's because of a real category or a category we just make up. The person in, um, who has the most power is going to be more influential in transmitting their emotions. I also told, taught you about the vagus nerve that, um, that we measure with high heart rate variability related to physical and mental health. So pay attention to your own levels. It's actually something that we can physiologically change um, with exercise and meditation, and you should expect variation in your heart rate.
Um, and that not all stress is bad for you. Good stress can help you uh, with both physical and cognitive performance. So embrace the good stress um, and try to figure out what are the situations that lead you toward having a good stress response for a bad stress response. Um, so that's it in terms of my short story. Thank you so much, Wendy. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this intensely emotional conversation. I know I got my Vegas nerve going. I hope you guys do as well. My name is, um, hold on one second. I'm sorry about that. I have a little bit of audio technical difficulty. I don't want to blow you guys out too much. My name is Ahmed Best. Um, as Rick said, I'm the host of the Afrofuturist podcast. I am also... Um, the adjunct lecturer and professor at the School of Dramatic Arts at the University of Southern California, as well as a guest professor at the Stanford University D School. I am a senior fellow at the Annenberg School of Communications and Journalism. Um, and there's a bunch of other stuff that I do that you can find out there somewhere else. But um, I am a performing artist. I'm a writer, director, actor, producer. And that is really near and dear to my heart because I am in the emotional business. What I do has always been and will forever be extremely emotional. And selfishly, I would love to start there because I heard, Wendy, that you were a ballet dancer. It was many, many years ago before I even went to college um, and, and finished high school early. I danced um, with several uh, professional ballet companies and then had a career ending injury when I was 21 years old mm. and had to sort of pick up the pieces of my life and uh, found my way into college. And then, you know, started a new journey there. So, and I do think that sort of early experience as a performing artist is part of what seeded my interest in psychophysiology because I was always acutely aware of, yes. you know, right, what that felt like right before you went on stage and how that could help me or hurt me. So I think I was just destined to do this kind of work because of that early yes. experience. Absolutely. That's kind of where I was going because everyone knows that feeling of whether you're a performing artist or not, we've all had an experience in front of an audience. We've all had an experience having to either public speak or be on stage and say things and say words um, for people like me who are performing artists, that's my favorite place on earth. That's home to me. Yeah. So um, I can see how I would have a challenge yeah. threat there, challenge stress, right? Mm -hmm. However, the threat stress is there as well. So how does the challenge and threat stress in something like ballet affect the other dancers? And how does that affect the audience when we're talking about contagious emotions? Yeah, yeah, great question. So um, challenge stress uh, definitely affects the performer, right? And, and those physiologic reasons um, or mechanisms of challenge stress it are so clear in why they would affect things like athletic performance or, you know, performing arts. Uh, one needs a lot of that juice, meta the metabolic sugar, the oxygen, the oxygen in our blood to think quickly, to perform, right? It's not surprising that those athletes did better when they were more likely to have a challenge stress response. The threat response, and by the way, it's not so much a person level effect. So we all can experience challenge or threat. Um, so I'm at like, right, you have done this for years, right? This is, this is your sweet spot. You know, do you, I would expect you never to have a threat response in something like this, but I could probably figure out the paradigms of the situations in which you weren't exposed to. You didn't have a lot of familiarity, expose mm. you to that then we would likely see that threat response. So familiarity is super important. Now, do these um, contagious emotions, do they transfer just in person or can you actually receive these through a screen? Yeah, that was a great question. And, you know, COVID sort of created this really interesting platform for us to study this because we had primarily studied it in face-to-face. -face. Here's what's interesting. Face-to-face -face is really powerful because there's more of our senses activated. So I'll give you the bottom line first, which is that face-to-face -face is more powerful. And maybe it's something like as simple as olfactory or this, you know, 
smell and sort of our ability to uh, better sense emotions in others when they're in front of us. Now, when you're on videos or something two dimension, I would say the signal has to be stronger. So mm -hmm. you might still have an influence, but you have to both turn up the signal of the transmitter and the person receiving. So that person receiving has to be highly vigilant, paying attention, um, and that person transmitting has to have a larger amplitude of emotional response to really see the effect. So how would you turn up those signals? Say if I wanted to create more of an emotional contagious reaction from an audience through a screen, what would you have to do? Well, okay, so there's a low road and a high road. A low road we think about are five senses, right? So I don't have smell, so I have to push that one away and I don't have touch. So those two, I've taken away two super important ones. So I have um, what I see and what I hear. Oh, and I, I also took away taste. <laughs> so I only have two. I have to increase the exaggeration of my face, which is really interesting when you think about performing arts and like stage versus film, right? right. Well, it, uh, I mean, you would tell me better than I could tell you how different that is the stage versus film because of just the closeness. So to get a reaction from somebody that is not in person, you're gonna have to turn up the face in sort of expression in the body, um, what you could see, and then what you could hear. So different mm. modulation of your voice. I mean, when you look at like the operating room study, um, really the primary mechanism through which that emotion is getting transmitted from the surgeon to the other people is their voice, right? Everything's covered on their face. They have these masks on. You can't see yeah. anything. You can't smell anything. It's their voice. And when you listen to operating room, um, uh, audio, the voice is powerful and they modulate their voice more. Then there's a high road. A high road just means like, I can, I can pick up your emotions better if I try to perspective take. Like what's Ahmed thinking? Is he thinking this is boring or fun? So the more I perspective take on somebody, the more likely I am to catch their emotions. It's probably one of the reasons that high status people don't catch the emotions of lowest, low status people because they are less likely to engage in perspective taking. What is that person thinking? Where low status people are much more likely to imagine like, oh, what are they thinking? What do they think of me? And so those are kind of a low road, high road differences. Yeah, um, and I, I found it interesting when you were talking about the operating room study, right? And how the head surgeon is kind of dictating the emotions in the room. Right. And it started making me think about leaders and, and we as human beings, what we look for a leader. Are we looking for someone to lead us physically or are we looking for someone to lead us emotionally? Are we looking for someone who has those emotional cues that we can actually just grab onto and let them express for us? Yeah, leaders are really powerful that way as sort of emotional leaders, right? To the extent that the leader in the room, so in some of our studies, we just randomly assign, you're the leader. And if right. you just randomly assign, I'm, I'm the leader, all of a sudden people are paying more attention to that leader and that leader often steps up and is more expressive. So we do want leaders to help us sort of um, dictate what do we think, how do I want to learn? This also has some ideological differences. Let's put that to the side a little bit. But there is something powerful about a leader who expresses clear and unambiguous emotions, because then you reduce the uncertainty of their followers. Oh, I'm supposed to be angry. My leader's angry. I'll be angry, too. Mm. Leaders are incredibly powerful, whether it's a leader in your house, you know, it, who's, who's sort of the dominant person in the household, your work. Uh, but also politics, um, you know, that leader and um, how we understand the world is is a powerful part of our social environment. And are those emotion, the, the, the contagious emotions from a leader, from a room, is that cultural? Like, can I lead someone in Korea, right? Me not being Korean, are those emotional cues yeah. picked up through culture? Um, are they picked up through species? Can you can you have an emotional effect, a contagious effect to your household pets, you know, to animals in the wild? Yeah, super interesting. On the on the culture, let's let's tackle that first. So um, there are cultural differences in how um, individuals relate, right? There's a whole like brilliant world of cultural psychology that studies this. And, and sometimes you have to be careful that the cultural differences don't just become sort of these weird stereotypes. So right. Um, right. lots of sensitivity around this, but um, 
you know, there's some really interesting work about cultures that are more interdependent, like rely on each other more and more independent. So like the U.S. is sort of considered a more independent, autonomous, like I know what I'm doing, leave me alone. And some cultures are more, you know, it, the group matters. There's more mm -hmm. sort of understanding. So we do see, we have done some studies um, that looked at the extent to which interdependent cultures are different than independent cultures. And just like your intuition suggested, I mean, it's the interdependent cultures that have less of um, a designated leader. So there's more reciprocity when they're influencing each other. Like I talked a lot about like the leader determining everything. That's kind of an American US thing. Um, when we go into other cultures, we see a little bit more reciprocity. So for example, what that would mean is the person speaking sort of generates everybody's attention. They sort of are more influential and in dictating the emotions. But then somebody else speaks and you see more changing in sort of who the, the catalyst is in the emotional state. Mm. So really good idea, really excellent point about culture. Animals are sort of interesting, right? Like to the extent that your domesticated animals sort of can sort of pick up on um, sort of who the dominant person in the household is, you know, animals are very sensitive to that. Some of my um, early work though, actually used animals and domesticated beloved pets to look at challenge and threat differences. So um, the presence of your beloved dog or cat um, can be associated with more of that challenge or acute stress, you know, good response and bad response. Right. Um, I would love to talk about this idea of physiologically what happens to your body, chemically what happens to your body um, with emotional contagion, uh, specifically when we're talking about um, things like oppression, right? Mm -hmm. Can the emotions of oppression change your physiology in such a way that it could transfer that those physiological cues through your genes? And can you pass those cues on? Yeah, I mean, it's such a good question. So, um, so there's the one part about um, oppression and sort of how do you turn that into behavior and, and um, you know, sort of uh, civic engagement, you know, people in America especially are like almost afraid of, a, of anger as an emotion. Yeah. But as a researcher, I can tell you, I, I'm a big fan of anger um, because I find it uh, in our lab studies, but in real world studies, anger is powerful at motivation. So when people are angry, they're more likely to engage in, uh, corrective behavior. Now, I'm not saying that anger is always good, right? Uh, um, anger can also turn into aggression and has its negative outcomes. But in terms of motivating people to make change, we shouldn't be too afraid of anger um, yeah. with, with its own limits. In terms of sort of this intergenerational transmission, um, sort of a lot of very interesting work on um, how we raise our kids and how we talk about emotions uh, and how we talk about sort of past and future. And I think there's something really powerful um, that happens in how parents talk to their children, both in terms of um, empathy, how they understand other people, um, in-group, out-group differences. Um, and so there, you know, these early lessons, your early social life is really setting a stage for your physiology for many years to come. How do you feel about this term emotional intelligence? Like we hear about that all the time. Is there an intellect behind emotions? Is it just driven by evolution? Like what, it, it, it's become such a thing. Like everybody talks about, you have to have this X amount of emotional intelligence in order to deal with that, 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 that in the workplace, right? What is this term emotional intelligence and, and how do we use it correctly, right? Or how do we use it effectively? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, emotional intelligence is, is well, I think most importantly, um, it's something that is learned and cultivated over many years, right? So it's not just something like we're born with emotional intelligence. You can become more emotionally intelligent. So um, one way to think of emotional intelligence is sort of how do we understand the emotions of others? Um, are we good at uh, understanding our own emotions, like what am I feeling and thinking? So here's here's sort of an interesting um, little game to play with yourself. The next time that you're feeling sort of generally negative, 
try to be much more specific about what you're feeling. So high mm-hmm. emotional intelligence is um, not that, you know, so I feeling like generally negative. What is it? Well, I'm angry about this, or I'm sad about this, or I'm disgusted about this. That specificity of emotional experience is part of emotional intelligence, and it helps you resolve that negative uh, emotion faster. So if I can right. figure out the target of like, I wake up and I feel like shit, well, gosh, I'm just angry because a grant was rejected. And I, that sort of helps me label it and then resolve it quicker. Right. Um, and then there's the emotional intelligence of other people. Like, am I paying attention to like um, what you're saying, your your body posture, how you're um, talking to me, right? That helps me sort of try to understand you better. And that makes us more, you know, uh, physiologically linked, which is good um, because we know each other's minds better the more I understand what you're thinking. Right. So embracing the complexity of your emotions and being able to articulate with specificity what those emotions are, that's how you get more yeah. intelligent emotionally. Yeah. And I can imagine that, that you must do that with actors a lot, right? Like you don't want them generally to just be negative feelings, right? You're telling them that it's it's got to be which kind of negative emotions, right? The more specificity, yeah. right? Yeah, constantly. And and with actors, it is about the action, right? It's about the action word. And there is an engine that drives everyone emotionally. But, you know, a lot of times actors want it, right? Actors want emotion. And a lot of the times, generally, human beings are trying to move away from their emotions, yeah. right? They're yeah. trying to be emotionless. Mm-hmm. And they try to make dispassionate, emotionless decisions. Is right. that possible? <laughs> Is it possible to make an emotionless decision? Well, emotion and cognition are really intimately linked. I mean, the the sort of bifurcation of it has always been problematic. You know, our you know, emotion doesn't live in one part of the brain and cognition in the other, right? They're, they're mm. sort of very well linked. Now it's the, um, you know, that instinct. So, so the one example that I gave of decision-making, right? Like yes. those decisions that are like immediate, like you're not even thinking reflexive. Those mm. are more likely to happen when we're high in arousal, but there's not as much sort of good blood going to our brain. But right. when we're high in arousal and you have more oxygenated blood, then it helps you take a moment, pause, and then you can solve sort of those reflexive versus you know, intuitive uh, decision-making problem. So yeah, you, you, you can, yes, emotions are associated with good decision-making all the time. It's that you don't want to be reflexive. Right. Reflective. Right. right. (laughs) Um, I I can ask you questions all day long, but I'm hogging all the time and I want to grab some questions from the audience. Here is one from Jeffrey, which we kind of touched on. How important is personal contact and emotional contagion? Do people who cry readily when a person talking to them is crying also cry readily when viewing photos of people crying? Yeah. Okay. So emotional empathy is highly related to this affect contagion. So when people are are high in emotional empathy, they are more likely to catch the emotions of others. Back to that kind of face-to-face versus sort of the distant, but the the photos or the videos, you know, it just always takes a a little bit more signal to catch the emotions of others that aren't um, in your presence and also close others. So, right. Even if I'm high in emotional empathy, uh, crying with a stranger is going to take longer than crying with my best friend, right? right. So that's not surprising. But yeah, empathy is very much tied to these experiences. Here's one from Walter. Are there ways for us to prevent negative contagion from affecting us? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is so fascinating because I never, you know, when we started this work, um, you know, we sort of were aware that obviously you could pick up negative emotions of of the other of people um like imagine group mentality sort of that group mob mentality um as people get angry and then more people get angry um so yes it, there's it is not always going to be a positive a net positive to pick up the emotions of 
others. Um, it does say something about your intent when you're getting, you know, picking up the emotions of people around you for whom you care about. Hmm. In, um, in an example with like a mob mentality, how would you not sort of pick up the emotions of others? I mean, I think that's where um, you want to separate yourself. You know, what would I say? How would you prevent uh, mob mentality from happening? You need more sort of critical people on the ground, you know, sort of good uh, target people for whom they're not being affected, right? If the leaders of a group are going to be really powerful in terms of um, uh, reducing the amount of affect contagion, uh, whether those are, you know, security guards who sort of, you know, um, are helping sort of manage the crowd. Here's, a, here's the example I would use. We're on a plane and um, the, you get you hit really rocky turbulence, right? A, a thoughtful person is going to look at a flight attendant, right? Do they look nervous? And as long as that flight attendant looks calm, then we should be calm. You would never want the flight attendant to be like, oh my God, here it is, you know? So, you know I've been on a couple of those flights. <laughs> so it's, you know, who are you looking at in terms of how are you deciding how to feel? You know, look for the people for whom are going to be kind of the leaders in the moment. On that mob mentality question, does size matter? Like if you have a huge mob that is on this negative emotional contagion, how many people does it take to calm that mob down? Do yeah. you need an equal size? This is kind of like the, the five minutes, five widgets question. Do you need yeah. an equal size <laughs> amount of people to calm down the mob? Or yeah. is it like a small strategic or is it just one person with the right signal? Yeah, I mean, we can think of some um, recent historical examples where maybe just one person with the right signal could have calmed down a mob. Um, but yeah, you know, it's it's a good question. And I don't know, like the really good, I can, I'll give you my best guess is that uh, it would be a really unusual one person for whom they could turn off a mob, but that might exist. Um, and yes, the larger, there's no question that the larger the group, the more kind of emotion in the air could be more problematic and harder to turn off than just a couple of, uh, you know, rebel rousers. Here's a question from Hillary. What are the implications of this research for clinical applications? I'm thinking of chronic pain and also things like, please forgive me if I mispronounce this, trichotillomania. Um, does the Vega, vagus nerve simulator stimulator work on these? Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so the, the transcutaneous vagal nerve stimulator is like really new. It's just kind of coming out. So, so for decades, people with epilepsy had an implanted vagal nerve stimulator. And what they mm. found is those implanted vagal nerve stimulators helped with depression symptoms. Mm. Um, and that's where, and then the science sort of said, look, you know, this, these vagal nerves are intimately tied with emotions. And that's where we got to sort of starting to, to study transcutaneous vagal nerve stimulators. There's been limited clinical application, um, but currently my lab is one of the ones um, running a study where we're looking at clinical applications with depression and uh, social anxiety. There also been clinical applications with language acquisition. So, so like I said, cognition and emotion are not two separate systems. These vagal nerve stimulators can both help with things like language acquisition um, in terms of directing attention, but also reducing negative emotions. So the uh, goal, I would say, give it you know five years before we really understand. But I do think the class of uh, mental health applications will be primarily with things like anxiety, more mood related um, depression, and maybe autism. What about folks who can't see emotional cues, right? Who can't get that, can't get those emotional cues. They have maybe um, uh, a brain affect or something going on within their nervous system that they just have a hard time with this. Yeah. Can that be contagious or how does that affect those people? Um, so primarily for people who um, are not, so I'll use sort of, you know, individuals who have autism or somewhere on the spectrum or autism disorder, um, helping them direct their attention uh, to the right view. So teaching them to look at people's faces, for example, or behavior mm. as, a, as a behavioral therapy is somewhat successful. Um, the T transcutaneous vagal nerve stimulator has been used to help individuals with autism uh, sort of 
hone in on um, people's faces because a lot of of the deficits are because they're not looking in the right place sometimes. It's not all of the problem, mm -hmm. um, but some of the problem is, um, you know, looking at a doorknob instead of somebody's face. And that um, could obviously undermine your ability to detect emotions. All right, we have time for one last question. And um, this question I really like, and it's from Amy. And, is, and the question is, how is affect contagion different than being a, an HSP or an empath? And is it possible to, um, and, and I'm going to combine this with Shannon's question, um, is this possible to uh, prevent the loss of empathy? And how do you get empathy back once it's lost? Yeah. Yeah. So yes, it is the Good case. Question. And I, by the way, I don't know what HSP is, but um, I, but because she said empath, I'm going to assume that it's this idea that people can, you know, feel the emotions of others, but it's part of the empathy um, mm. cluster that I was uh, talking about. You know, when we teach clinicians, um, we want clinicians who are empathetic, but you also don't want to burn out, right? Because right. imagine that tremendous roller coaster that one would be on if after you know six clients a day, you were sort of up and down and distressed and sad, you know, from experiencing the emotions of others. So there are, you know, we have this distinction in cognitive, I just said don't separate cognition and empathy. There's cognitive empathy and there's emotional empathy. So we do try to do the cognitive empathy. Think about what they're saying rather than feeling what they feel. And that can help reduce burnout because um, it can be exhausting uh, to be on the leash of your emotions um, yeah. if it's somebody else controlling them. Well, Wendy, this has been a fascinating, fascinating, fascinating conversation. I love everything about it. Like I said, I'm a very emotional person. I'm emotional as a business. And um, it's really fantastic to learn and to know and to really be able to differentiate what's going on in your body um, when we're talking about emotions and how emotional contagion can make us you know, come together and how make us a better world. Somebody asked what's behind me, what my thing says. It says, be the signal. <laughs> it says be the signal be the signal I like and, it. I like it. and it comes from it comes from futurist thinking futurists look for signals to give you cues and clues of what's going on in the future and i always say don't look for the signal be the signal be, be the thing signal. that everyone is looking and be a great signal great and signal. be an emotional signal <laughs> and like let it. your positive emotional signals be as contagious as wendy's talk Thank you so much, Science yeah. and Entertainment Exchange, for having me back. Please don't make it so long before I come back again, because I miss y'all. And you know that I want to be a scientist, and I'm a hobbyist scientist, and I love all things science. Rick, I'm talking to you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate yeah, you all. Until next time, thank you so much, Wendy yeah. Barry Mendez. Thank you. Uh, thank, thanks, everybody. A uh, couple quick points of order. Uh, I want to thank everybody who asked a question today. We had over uh, 70 of them. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I want to thank again our supporters who uh, came to the event today and joined at the $100 level. We couldn't have done this without you. Uh, I want to thank Courtney Sloan, Sachi Gerben, Jeff Fishman, and Ameche Upabi for pr technically producing this event. We are off for a little while, so keep an eye on your inbox because we're coming back on in October. So uh, thank you, everybody. See you next time. Thanks, Ahmed.